Steve's just offered to bring everyone back to quiet and then said, no, no, you're a teacher, it'll be fine. It's not going to be fine. But we'll get there eventually. I've got a good one this morning. It's essentially about judgment, everyone's favourite topic. I don't know whether you enjoy a piffy saying, whether you look forward to those times where your WhatsApp or Messenger service beeps and someone's sent through a one-liner to you, possibly with some flowers in a background or an inspiring landscape. We judge ourselves by our intentions, but others by, by their actions is a good one. It does have some truth in it. We do tend to give ourselves the benefit of the doubt. When we try to do something that doesn't work out right, we always think about what we are trying to do. But when someone else does something that doesn't work out right, we rarely think about what their intentions were. But like anything that's not biblical in the Word of God, it might be partly true, but it's not going to be the whole truth. The road to hell is famously paved with good intentions. And I do like the idea that you may have good intentions and you may have a heart of gold, but so does a hard-boiled egg. <laughs> Let's look at the Bible and see what that tells us about intentions and judging. We're looking at Romans chapter 12, verse 3 today, and I thought I'd go over the top and I'd read verses 1 and 2 again. I love reading the Bible. I think it's about the most useful thing I can do while I'm up here, to be honest, because it's the Word of God. But actually, all three verses are really relevant. They tie together. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly than we ought to think, but to think with sober judgment each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. I really think you have to read verse, two in, uh, verse 3 in light of verse 2. When it says, don't think of yourself more highly, don't think, think wrongly, that's carrying on the idea of not being conformed to the way the world thinks. The world often makes people think more highly of themselves than they should. When it tells us instead to have sober judgment, each according to the God standard, that is having that transformation that renews your mind so you think with God's thoughts. You see things as God sees them. But more than that, we're transformed by the renewal of our minds to be able to discern, but discern what? We saw that last week. And if you look at verse 3, what are we actually meant to do with this? Yes, it's right to do lots of the things that we heard about last week, but where does the passage go? We use this new way of thinking, thinking God's way, to judge ourselves. Not to go out there and judge others, primarily, but to start by looking at ourselves. And what's the point of that? Why should we judge ourselves, work out that we shouldn't be thinking too highly of ourselves, and work out this perfect will of God? I think it all ties back into verse 1. I think when we get to the end of this morning, we'll be able to see that the response to that is to want to offer our bodies as living sacrifices and know how to do that. I think the whole lot ties together. And we'll see in the next couple of weeks as we go through verse 4 through to about verse 8 or so, where, where is this heading? It talks about serving others, just as a heads up. But what is it that's going to cause this sober judgment? What measure is it, talked about in verse 3, that we need to use? Well, that's deep. That's heavy. Steve mentioned in the first week, looking at verse 1, that pretty much the first thing that happens in this chapter is a therefore Chapter 12, it's the start of the application of everything that's come before in the book of Romans. And it's going to make us sober. It's going to make us think differently. 
I'm going to try to summarize as quickly as possible quite a lot of very dense theology, but really, really good stuff, mostly in the words of the Bible um, with a few, a, a few of mine to try to make it a reasonable length. We find out in Romans uh, chapter 1 that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Not a popular thing, not something that comes up in the thinking of the world. If we're conforming to the world, we don't like that word. But the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and ungodliness that we have because we are without excuse, it says. It tells us that God gives people, gives us over to our lusts, our passions, and really importantly, it says he lets them be fools. He lets them have debased minds, and then he kind of firms up those debased minds that don't think God's way within them. Paul goes on to spell out that therefore we have, none of us have any excuse. Every one of you that judges, every one of us that judges, you're storing up wrath for yourselves because God is going to render to each of us according to his works, our works. Depending on what's deserved, the Bible says, either eternal life awaits or wrath and fury. But Paul goes on to say, doesn't matter whether you're Jew or Gentile, doesn't matter whether you've been brought up with the law proclaimed on the Sabbath or whether you've never heard it before, through people's consciences, through, uh, through just nature and what we see, and the fact that everyone realizes there must be a God, we are all judged as guilty. That option of everyone will get something, eternal life or wrath and fury as deserved, Paul says, but everyone's going the second way. No one is righteous, it says. No, not one. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. No one does good, not even one. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in God's sight. That's pretty sobering. Luckily, Paul goes on to say that's not the end of it. But now, the righteousness of God has been manifested, apart from the law, although the law and the prophets pointed to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, for everyone who believes. For there's no distinction. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but are justified by his grace as a gift. It's through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, who God put forward as a propitiation by his blood, and we receive it by faith. He gives the good news that we couldn't meet God's standard. We were unable to. But Jesus, God as a man, did meet that standard. He died for us. And he said, take it, take what I've done as a gift. And really importantly for what we're looking at today, Paul goes on. So what becomes then? of our boasting. It's excluded. You can't boast. By what kind of law? Is that by a law of works? Did you, is that because of what we've earned? No, by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from any works of the law. And there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's a summary of a lot of what Romans said in the first eight chapters or so. And that's what we're meant to be looking at and thinking about when we come on here to the application. That's what makes us think soberly about it. That's what's going to lead to us putting ourselves forward as living sacrifices. I was trying to come up with a way of getting us to better look and see some heavy concepts that we might know already and check really how far they've penetrated. Because as was said last week when we watched that video, Dave was saying this isn't a one-off event, the renewing of our minds. 
We don't just get transformed and on the day that we believe, we get a new brain with all the world's patterns wiped out and just God's way of thinking only. It's a gradual process that goes on through the rest of our lives, trying to not be conformed to the pattern of this world, trying to see things as God sees them. It's a process. And the lens that I thought of comes from about 30 years ago. Um, Philip Yancey, before he wrote lots and lots of books, used to just write articles for monthly Christian magazines. And a few of them were published together, some of the more thought-provoking ones, as a book, essentially of questions. And one of them is to do with thinking about things almost backwards. And I thought it was a great way to see things from a new angle, to get rid of that cataract, to see things clearly, like the word that Rebecca brought this morning. Yancey's one, he starts by saying that anthropologists have noticed that every society on earth that they have ever studied, every society has some sort of belief in the afterlife, and they are surprised by this. We shouldn't be. It's written in our hearts by God because it's true. But Yancey wrote this article about what would it look like if a society lost that belief in the afterlife. He turned things round. He does this with a lot more humour than I do, because, again, I'll try to keep it short. But he concluded that one of the things that would happen is that that society would value, because there's no hope at the end of life, if this life is all that there is and there's no afterlife, there is no heaven, there wouldn't be hope for the future. So that sort of society would presumably really value youth and would be scared about old age. It would reject anything like wisdom that's built up, value, style over substance, and go for youth. Probably, he says, sports, competitive sport, would be a national obsession. If you looked around, saw advertising hoardings, looked at your screens, looked at magazine covers, you'd see wrinkle-free faces everywhere. And his his uh, phrase, youthful, gorgeous bodies. He said that the best-selling videotapes, that dates it a bit, it really is that old, would probably be of ladies in their 40s leading exercise classes so that we can all join in and stay looking young and feeling young. And more than that, they really wouldn't value old age. They'd be scared of it. You know, people would spend a fortune on things like skin creams and anti-baldness cures, and maybe even cosmetic surgery. Society, at its worst, it might try to segregate people. If we're scared of old age because it tells us there's no hope and the end is coming, maybe we'd get old people and make them live in different places to us to keep them away from us. But they, in those last few years, if that's all they've got, they'd spend any accumulated wealth that they've um, got during their lives just trying to get that to last as long as possible, to eke it out. Yes, he concluded that at the end of it, though, when, it does, when life does draw to an end, that sort of society that doesn't believe in the afterlife, that doesn't want to be reminded about death because it's hopeless, probably you wouldn't have people dying in the family home surrounded by people that they love. You'd probably go and put them in a clinical setting, away, behind a screen, dealt with by professionals. And you might even not use honest language, but just use euphemistic language to describe that process. And he finishes by saying that he's so glad that he lives in the good old US of A, where, according to a recent Gallup poll, the vast majority of Americans absolutely believe in the afterlife. Just thinking backwards, what would it look like if we didn't believe something or did believe something is a great tool to be able to actually look at what we're thinking. And I want to remind you of this idea that this is a process. None of us have a completely transformed, renewed mind yet. We're all some way along the journey towards it, moving towards it. You could apply consumerism. If you believed, if the church believed in consumerism, what would that do to a Sunday morning and midweek to your lives? It's quite a scary thing to consider, but I want to think about these two ideas from Romans, grace and wrath, and think about what would it look like if we lost sight of those. So first of all, 
What would the world look like? What would the church look like? What would my life look like if we didn't really believe in God's wrath, in his justice, in his judgment? If we didn't have that balance between God's outrageous love for us, but the fact that his holiness is just non-negotiable, it's part of who he is, then probably, if we didn't really believe in that all the way, things would seem okay. Because no one would be in really, really bad trouble. There wouldn't be a need to give an awkward message to the world that makes us feel uncomfortable. I don't know if you've heard a quote from a guy a lot of years ago, C.T. Studd, who had the... He he could have been an England cricketer, probably the captain. He gave it up to go and do missionary work. But he said famously, some want to live within the sound of church or chapel bell. I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. We'd probably see someone like that as an outlier, an embarrassment. Someone we maybe talk to, allude to a quote to inspire people, but not someone we're genuinely going to go and actually emulate. That's not someone who's a model for how seriously we should be taking things. I think evangelism would probably drop rapidly down the priority list. We'd kind of better ignore the fact that Jesus said that it was so important, and we'd be a bit relieved because it can be difficult. I think our prayer lives, I think about my prayer life, if I sat in a conversation in life group about praying for something for 20 solid years, then I probably wouldn't be sat there thinking, there are people I know, there are people I love, there are people in my family that I should have been praying for for 20 years. I was quite good for a couple of years at the start. How often am I actually doing that now? That wouldn't be an issue. I think we'd see coming to Christ as a nice extra. Wouldn't it be nice if this person I know came along to church and got to know Jesus? Because it it just makes life nicer, doesn't it? It's great to know him and be able to talk to him. It's great to be part of community and see people. They're lovely people. It wouldn't be about salvation. It would be about other things. What would it look like if we lost track, if we didn't really get grace which is the second half of Romans. Well, I think the biggest danger is that we would just be terrified of God. If we actually got the first half, his holiness, his righteousness, his justice, his judgment, and we didn't get grace, we would be terrified of him. But if, we're, if this is a process, if we have understood it but haven't completely internalized it yet, Maybe we'd just be left with kind of a residual distrust. Okay, it's probably okay. It's definitely okay for that other person. Not quite sure about me. Maybe we wouldn't feel completely free. If we got the idea that grace didn't exist, if we hadn't understood grace completely, but we thought, well, some people must be saved, maybe that would lead instead to wanting to be saved through works. Maybe that means we'd really, really try because we thought that was the way to get God to love us. We'd have to do everything to try to be good enough and meet God's standard. Now, the actions there of someone might look similar to what we'd love to see. We want to see people who know that God and the person of Jesus died for them, and that's it. It's done. Because those people, when they know that, respond by serving, by having changed lives. And maybe the actions of somebody who's desperate to earn God's favor would look the same, running around doing loads of stuff, but the heart would be so different. There would be no peace there, just fear instead. You'd try and do things in your own strength, and it would go wrong some of the time. You might look around at others and judge them because you're trying to do so much and you just don't see it from them. We'd be obsessed by our own performance, our worth. I think it could lead one of two ways. 
I think some people might end up, because they're trying to do so much, ending up a bit proud about it. I think others would end up in a place where they have no self-esteem whatsoever. We see all too often from people a feeling that they're just not good enough for God. I don't know how many times you've been heartbroken by people hearing the gospel, seeming to understand, you know, hearing that Jesus died for them, and saying, but you don't know what I've done. God could no- never love me. If it's a process, if we're getting towards having renewed minds, but we're not all the way there, what would that look like for us? Maybe God's letting us in. We get in through the door to heaven, but he doesn't really want us fully involved because it's not his favorite. Those other people are far better than us. I won't be too involved with it. I think either route would lead to us not really responding, not wanting to live a life of sacrifice in response to a God who did all this for us. So, how does having a sober judgment of ourselves come about? How can we avoid any of those pitfalls? We need to renew our mind, it tells us. But how do we do that? What does that actually mean? I think, number one, it's time spent absorbing God's truth by spending time with him who is truth itself, whether that's talking to him in prayer or listening to him, being with others who know him and talking about God with them. I think primarily it's going to be revisiting the truth in the Bible that is that solid standard that does tell us what God is like, his character, his works, and doesn't miss any of this stuff out. The Bible is important. Looking at all of the Bible, not just the bits we like, but all of it is important. It's why it's so good. Looking at this bit from the New Testament, knowing that we've come from looking at Ezra before that and really mixing everything in there. I think we need to be really careful when it comes to worship music that we listen to to make sure that it's not just one part of the story we hear through that, but we hear Lots of different themes. I'm not talking about instrumental styles, anything like that. I'm talking about the themes, the words, the lyrics. Does that encompass everything? Or does it only paint one part of the Christian journey? One part of what we need to hear? I want to then dive in to the second half of verse 3. We're going to revisit much of the same stuff by doing this, to be honest. But I think that's useful. What does this sober judgment actually look like? I think we see that by looking at this phrase, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Okay, that sounds simple, but actually, throughout the centuries, people have divided into two camps on what that actually means. And both of the interpretations are biblical. They're both in line with what it says elsewhere in the Bible. They both have truth in them. They're both useful. The first one is not the one that most people think about at first. Um, This measure of faith could quite possibly be a measuring standard or a measuring instrument. This could be saying, you've heard the message of Romans. You've heard about God's righteous anger against sin and about the fact that he justifies us through our faith, nothing we've done. Take that, take that standard, measure yourselves up against that. How are you doing compared to God's perfection? How are you doing compared to the fact that he says you can have this as gift? And then when we soberly judge ourselves, we soberly admit that we can't possibly save ourselves. We can't possibly reach that standard. We can't dig ourselves out of the hole that our sin has got us into on our own. We can't live up to God's standards at all. And if we're honest, if we got rid of the taint of sin and actually looked at things objectively, do you know what? We can't even on our own live up to the standard that we've set for ourselves. We'd have to soberly admit to the fact that only God can save us. Only he can make us righteous. And only he can then equip us for service. That all of us, 
me, but all of us have been 100% saved, 100% by God, through Christ, through his righteousness, and we are 100% equipped by him. We can't boast about it. We can't boast about our salvation, and we can't boast about anything we then do to help others, any role we play in the church, looking forward to the next couple of weeks, because it's all from God. He deserves all the glory. We'd have to soberly admit that if God equips us, and if he entrusts us to serve in the church in certain ways, it's not because of us, But more than that, we'd have to admit soberly that God has equipped us because the Bible says so. Because we're now thinking in line with God's word. We'd have to admit that God has equipped us and that he has entrusted us to serve, to be included, to help others. I think it's equally important to avoid saying that we can't do things because that is denying God's action. It's denying Jesus on the cross. It's denying his grace and his plan for us. It's bringing God down to our level instead of trying to bring ourselves up to God's level. Both of them are wrong. It's also possible to interpret this phrase, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned, as got a measure different measures god gives us each different amounts of faith or different gifts and we might see that in the next couple of weeks but i think it's useful if we hold both pictures in mind if we're given a certain gift in the church and someone else is given another gift we've got different functions we've got different roles we like different parts of the body there's still no boasting Because where did it come from? It came 100% from Christ. We can use those gifts. We should use those gifts. It's part of God's plan. We must use those gifts. I think of the parable of the servant who's been entrusted with much. What he had to do was go away and do something with it. Hiding it in the ground was not what God wanted to happen I think sometimes we have an attitude that we're not worthy. There are other people around here who are better than me. I look at them. They're better at praying. I suspect they don't have the crises I have internally. They probably don't have a problem with that long-term prayer that I do. So I'll let them do all the service. I'll let them speak out when there is that lull in the worship. Because they're here from God better. That is not true. And if we don't contribute... We're denying other people of what God wants us to bring them from him. In summary, and I might ask the band to start coming back up if that's okay. This could be summed up again in a pithy phrase. There's not got the entire truth there. Humility. It's not about thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. Well, it's good not to just think about ourselves, but actually, that's not what the Bible's just said. The Bible said, think of God the most, think of Christ the most, understand his standard, and then think about ourselves, and that will make us humble, but in a good way. And go and do something about it. Go and be those living sacrifices in response to it. I'm going to end with quite a long quote. It comes from C.S. Lewis. It's heavy, because do you know what? It's true. He's understood how radical the message of the Bible is, and he's put it down without pulling any punches. It may be possible for each to think too much of his own potential glory hereafter, but it's hardly possible for any of us to think too often or too deeply about that of our neighbours. It's a serious thing to live in a society with possible gods and goddesses, to remember that the dullest, most uninteresting person you can possibly talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it right now, you would be strongly tempted to bow down and worship, or else a horror and a corruption, such that if you now met it, 
It would only be in your nightmares. All day long, we are, to some degree, helping each other to one or the other of those destinations. It's in the light of those overwhelming possibilities that we should conduct all our dealings with each other, all friendships, all loves, all play, all politics, because there are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilizations, they are mortal, and their life, compared to ours, is like the life of a gnat. But it's immortals that we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. Immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. We need to judge ourselves having got God's mind for us. And then we need to respond to it. I would love to pray. The leadership team and prayer ministries here t- t- team would love to pray today for all the things that came out earlier. But also, if actually that gospel, that grace, isn't something that's made sense, please come and pray with us about it. But given that this is a continuum, this is a process, none of us have understood and internalized all of this stuff Absolutely. None of us have that perfectly restored, transformed mind. Please come and pray. Because spending time with God, reading the Bible will get us there, but prayer is his tool. And we're asked to help each other, to serve each other as well.